Hello, welcome to My Favorite Things, the video series where I compile a bunch of random stuff I like into a ranked list that takes significantly less work than my regular videos. Oh, I said the quiet part out loud. I have this memory from about 30 literal years ago. For some reason, my mom and I were awake at about 4 a.m. and we're watching a film in which two animated anthropomorphic dog people are singing in front of a gigantic Satan? monster and even back then i remember feeling like oh this is weird i don't know if i should be uh watching this one having no idea what this was or any detail about it satan and the singing dog people this was my best guess as to what the movie might be called haunted me for decades until now through an anecdote slightly too uninteresting to tell in this video i recently learned the name of this film rock and rule the story takes place in a post-apocalypse where a great war has wiped out humanity and street animals have evolved to replace us with a cast of anthropomorphic dogs slash rats slash cats slash bat people lending another unfortunate chapter to the book I will one day be forced to write called no I'm I'm not a furry a uh, wolf is just my YouTube icon because I think wolves are cool but yeah if people want to dress up in fursuits and that makes them happy I I really don't see a problem with that you know wait what, what's that well yeah yeah, an unusual amount of media. I do like features anthropomorphic characters, but I really don't think that counts for... Uh, I'm sorry? Renamon, this interview is over! Rock and Roll is exactly as strange as my seven-year-old child brain identified it was. Made in 1983 by an extremely talented, albeit very inexperienced team of animators, the film went massively over schedule and over budget due to the bizarre way it was made. Rather than script to concept to storyboards to animation, Rock and Roll's 200-person staff just kinda did everything all at once, with scenes being animated in one room and rewritten in the next, in a production that was just as much lunatic asylum as it was animation studio. And if you think that's harsh, well, those are the literal words of the person who directed it. And the result is a borderline incomprehensible and surreal movie. One scene will present you with large bumbling characters slapstickily slamming into each other as they do the dumb guy cartoon voice. The next we'll see our cast of anthropomorphic dog people descending into a drug-fueled sex club, creating a tonal whiplash I can only liken to watching 15 minutes of a Mickey Mouse cartoon before before Goofy starts shooting heroin and getting his dick sucked. The resulting movie is a bizarre mishmash of genres, ideas, and target audiences, whose budget ballooned to $8 million, making a box office loss of nearly $8 million. This is a glorious train wreck of an animation from an era that did not know better. And for all its messy and borderline
borderline incomprehensible about it, it also has moments of genuine stunning beauty, like the final scene with Satan. It took eight different types of traditional animation to make Satan look and move like this, and it gives the creature this overwhelming sense of weight and horror. This terrifying abomination bearing down on these two poor tiny dog rat people who do the only thing they can against him. They sing. It is quite baffling, but there's also something genuinely powerful and hopeful about this scene. And I think that's a big part of the reason it stuck for me for 30 years and why the film has developed a cult following in that time. And I'm glad, because you know what? Some things are too interesting to be forgotten. Is there a more cursed decision in Nintendo's history than breaking a deal with Sony and signing with Philips to develop a CD drive? That shattered seal opening up a dark gateway through which two abominable monstrosities would lurch forth. One was the Sony PlayStation and the other the Zelda CDI games. Grotesque marionettish carvings of what the Legend of Zelda was meant to be. Realities where entropy pulls apart the DNA of Hyrule and reassembles it into something distorted and frightening. The one single corruption in the history of the legendary game series, as well as Skyward Sword. I say all this because developer CDI Software has committed the actual crime of creating a spiritual sequel to those accursed CDI Zelda games, RZ and the Jewel of Faramore. The criminals who made this game going to the absurd lengths of rehiring the original voice actors and animators and the result is something that so horrifically recreates the feel of those awful games that I cannot help but love it. A cave system's nearby. Throw a bomb and you'll be spelunking in no time. Take this. If you use rope in dark places, you'll escape back to safety. I appreciate it. I... Ultimately, I think what kept those CDI games alive isn't that they were necessarily bad, but just how fucking weird they were. There is just nothing that feels like these games until now. And it's kind of stunning how earnestly RZ captures that same bizarre charm. Oh, thank you for releasing me, dear. Allow me to heal you. All right. <laughs> As a reward. How about some fairy dust? No thanks! Oh, I insist! The actual video game part of this video game being infinitely more competent than its godforsaken progenitors. So fair play to CDI Entertainment. If you need a voice actor for another game, I would be partial to such a discussion. Chat, let me ask you a question. Do you ever want to just... hurt? Someone? You've all seen that humiliating footage of Krell, right? Can you imagine thinking you're so strong and cool, and then one day just BAM! That happens? And then some little angel films it, and uploads the vid for the whole city to see? I don't know about you guys, but I would actually want to die, like actually. Like crawl into the gutter and never show my ugly face again. So, you want to know what I say, chat? In honor of the little skank's long overdue downfall, I'm gonna be dropping a very special merch run! Featuring not only that pathetic waste of skin at her absolute worst, but also our girl Damage, who we can all thank for bringing that disgusting crow crashing down to Earth. And you love supporting your angel mama, right? Then get your cute little butts over to iPatchWolves.com. Pronto. T-shirts. Fucking buy them. Demon City Shinjuku is a 1987 movie cursed with being released in the same two-year window as both Wicked City and Legend of the Overfiend. With a similar vibe and aesthetic to those movies, Demon City is the one least remembered, possibly because it contains the least demon fucking, which is a shame because while the action is great and the story is... 
There, the movie is directed by Yoshikawa Kawajiri, whose directorial credits include both Ninja Scroll and Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust, Demon City being this little hidden gem from a man whose films would define Tao record anime shelves for decades to come. And you can feel his trademark style taking hold in this movie, and particularly in its atmosphere. The film cinematography framing the city in a way that just brings it to life in such a stark and harsh light. Its color palette cast in these neon slides obsidians, making for a vibe and experience I could only really convey through a short but atmospheric AMV that of course I did not have time to make is what a worse YouTuber would say! <laughs> Nun or HC Nun is one of my favorite artists, not only because their illustrations always feel loose and expressive and fun, but because they're able to retain those qualities in the tighter, more intricate world of pixel art, and particularly in their original work, which tends to focus on a small world of anime office workers, which has recently been adapted into a surreal visual novel called Endless Mondays. Something that appeals to me greatly as due to the bizarre route my life has taken, I now see office work as a weird kind of escapist fantasy that deeply misguided desire now fulfilled in this office work simulator where you can live the fantasy of fantasizing about avoiding office work and playing video games. Putting aside the fact that that previous sentence is clearly the apocalyptic bell toll signaling that video games as a medium have gone too far, I really enjoyed my time with Endless Mondays. At times surreal and funny as you encounter time traveling aliens and are pulled into bizarre alternate dimensions and at times oddly poignant as these people trapped in this corporate obelisk struggle to define their lives within it while the ones that have broken free are burdened with now re-establishing their identities without that structure. The gorgeous art and expressive character Work adding to both those vibes, cementing Endless Monday as an ideal Steam Deck before bed em up. Say what you will about the early 2000s, and you could say a lot, but it was a weirdly optimistic time for video games, where publishers were convinced that they were a single weird game away from being the next Resident Evil or Halo, and throwing money into, well, just about anything, resulting in a slew of strange titles, often too weird for AAA dominance, but unique enough to the point that we still talk about them. Your Mad Worlds, your God Hands, your No More Heroes, your, I guess, Chaos Legion? Any other fans of Chaos Legion out there? No? Okay. The beauty of these B games is that they were strange enough to be interesting while still having some actual developer budget behind them, but in the years since, games have kind of polarized. With most titles falling either on the side of AAA mega production or weird indie pixel slash low poly passion project, the middle ground of the B game having disappeared, which is why it's so fucking cool to see something as weird yet polished as Konitsugami Path of the Goddess. Part RPG, part real time strategy, part base builder, part tower defense, part animal petting simulation. There are you happy you fucking Twitter account? It feels like something weird enough to come straight out of that era. As you, a masked samurai, must command a posse of villagers, each of whom you can assign a variety of roles from thief to sumo wrestler, as you position them around a map in an attempt to keep your magical dancing princess from being devoured by a horde of demon known as the Seethe. It sounds messy and complicated, and it is at first, but even after being kind of baffled by it, it's one of those games I found myself thinking about even when I wasn't playing it, planning out troop formations and considering level layouts, as my wife desperately begged me to focus on our house move. The game's challenge dragging me back again and again, and as it did, the sheer polish and personality of this game becoming more prominent every session, from how bizarrely horrifying the designs of the seed are, to the intricate modeling on even just minor equipable items. Seriously, there is 
zero reason that this ancient Japanese rice dessert be rendered with this level of care. So even just the little animations of your villagers springing into action as you command them to repair the ruined village, while you stand there clutching your sword, doing nothing to help construction, but thinking, ah yes, I am the hero this world needs. Probably the strongest selling point of this game though, is when you understand what it's asking you to do, it all flows together with an addictive quality that's emblematic of what a B game should be. Weird, idiosyncratic, and teeming with love and passion from the people who made it, given a budget to realize that vision. Welcome to the first joint entry on this list in Delicious in Dungeon and Free Rin, two anime that take the same broad concept of fantasy and run in polar opposite directions with it. Delicious in Dungeon feels more like an intimate D&D campaign as you and a group of your knuckle-headed friends navigate the different floors of a strange dungeon, encountering all kinds of amazing creatures, dragons, orcs, kobolds, lesbians, and what makes those encounters special is how Delicious in Dungeon holds a microscope up to typically familiar your fantasy tropes and explores them, establishing full-on habitats, ecology, biology, and, uh, taste. Gradually building up this really intricate and intimate sense of what this place is. Like each new floor and monster is this tactile puzzle to be solved, and then often devoured. Like take the living armor, a typical fantasy D&D creature, but what makes it so intriguing here is how it's explained as a race of jellyfish-like creatures that crawl through the cracks in armor and then marionette the suits of armor to attack their prey, which can then be cooked and turned into a delicious stew, which is kind of gross, but I would also definitely eat. Also ghost ice cream. I really want to eat the ghost ice cream. Freerun, on the other hand, is kind of the total opposite. Less a game of Dungeons and Dragons and more like a sweeping fantasy novel, with the intimate encounters of Delicious and Dungeon replaced by a series that can span years or even decades in a single episode, where ancient evils are banished in mere moments and our heroes age out and die over the course of minutes, all viewed through the eyes of our titular elven protagonist, Freerin, whose elven lifespan vastly outweighs our own, as she watches the era, world, and people around her all age and fall away. In this quiet, contemplative meditation on what it ultimately means to form connections that cannot last. The show's tone ping-ponging between chill, mournful, and occasionally some of the hypest anime fights I've seen in quite some time, in a way that could would not feel more distinct from the culinary lunacy of Delicious in Dungeon. But for as different as both these shows are, what they both represent to me is something I've wanted to see in anime for a while. A return to traditional fantasy anime that does not clad itself in the irony and genre tropes of isekai. And that's not saying all isekai are bad, just the ones I've seen. As for which I'd suggest you watch, that is honestly going to come down to your own personal tastes. So allow me to make this easy. Which of these two dwarves do you want to hang out with? Pick one. There, you have your answer. Hello, welcome to the most disturbing part of this video. The YouTube Zone. What horrors await us within? What disturbing truths will we uncover? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what this bit is. Um, here's some YouTubers I like. When I first stumbled on Magilar's videos, they were instantly my shit. Person with good comedic timing talks about video games I have never heard of. Fantastic. However, over the last two years, Magilar's videos have evolved into something else. I will never play the Ultima series. I do do not care, this is not how I spend my time. Yeah, I was riveted by every second of Magilar's multi-hour Ultima series retrospective. There's a history and culture to these games that I straight up just did not appreciate before watching these. And I say that as someone who was frequently PK'd in Ultima Online. My naked corpse left, rotting in the cold. God, that game was brutal. Maybe even more powerful though is when Magilar deep dives into the truly obscure, like his most recent video on Sega Saturn RPGs. As you all know, I am a freakish internet hell goblin, but even that in mind, the amount of fascinating games I had never heard of from this video was insane. From the limbs-based cyberpunk RPG to the passionate examination of what was so cool about the Sega Saturn Shining Force RPGs. And it got me thinking how videos like this aren't just entertainment, they are in themselves acts of preservation, exposing these games to hundreds of thousands more people, leading to higher rates of translation and emulation efforts. None of that happens if Magilar doesn't make those journeys as fun and entertaining as he does. He also has a full-on video about the Zelda CDI games if you would like to, uh, experience those nightmares, which I would recommend if you're gonna play RZ.
If you want to know if the channel Grimbeard is for you, see how you react to this statement. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is the greatest TV show of all time. Now, no one, and I mean no one, is going to agree with that statement. But how long did it take you to reach the conclusion of no it isn't? Because if it's over four seconds, you need to check out Grimbeard. Maybe more so than any other YouTuber I've ever watched, Grimbeard's videos are grounded in the hyper-specific era of the 2000s. Not just in the games they talk about, but the discussions about media they couch those conversations in. A video about obscure PS1 Deadly Premonition Progenitor and copyright straining adventure game Mizorna Falls can quickly spiral out into a discussion about Twin Peaks and other media of that era, feeding back into what this game is and what its creators were trying to achieve. Grimbeard taking that same lens to every game they talk about, from more well-known titles like Silent Hill, which is probably the best breakdown of that original game I've ever watched, to more obscure titles like, you know, that one PS2 goth girl game with the weird magazine ads that you never played but for some reason still think about her smudged eyeshadows and pouting lips and tribal tattoos calling you back to a simpler time when things made sense when you didn't speak into a microphone for an hour to a bunch of strangers you'll never okay look i get a lot of nostalgic comfort from grimbeard's videos but the truth is i would watch grimbeard talk about pretty much anything and have falling into my favorite category of youtuber person who has been making videos for an inordinately long amount of time who in that time has developed a style unique and distinct from anyone else but for whatever reason has never quite reached the following I feel like they deserve, who I then promote in these videos in a futile effort to alleviate my own vicious and debilitating imposter syndrome. Everything Grimbeard makes has this intangible personal feel, which comes from the simultaneously detached yet passionate style of writing, to the syrupy goth aesthetic they drench every part of their videos in, to the background music that they write themselves. And I love that. If I was to break down video essays into a simple formula, I would say it is passion multiplied by a person's ability to convey that passion, and Grimbeard maxes out both those categories. So, my dear beloved wolf pack, you know what we gotta do here. I'm listing my favorite Magellar and Grimbeard videos in the description. Please go support these amazing creators. I am now going to talk about the 2023 video game Lies of P. I am going to set myself the goal of doing so without discussing any other video games it may or may not resemble. Here we go. Taking inspiration from games like... Um... Fuck, uh, Metal Gear Rising and <sighs> King's Fields? Liza P is clearly a game that uh, likes other video games, but the reason we're talking about it on this list is the unique identity it carves out of those influences. An identity that is not obvious at first. The game's controls feel a little stiff, its art direction reminiscent of other titles, and a parry that is oddly timed, requiring you to hit it slightly before an enemy attack lands, as opposed to on contact, which just wreaks havoc with my third strike adult brain. However, push through the ankle high sludge that is getting used to this game's controls, and what awaits you on the other side is a fucking joy. A combat system bursting with both loose creative player expression and flow state inducing split second decision making. As you deconstruct and recombine the game massive variety of weapons all with their own movesets and balance their various strengths and weaknesses against the multitude of offensive and defensive options provided by the game's different mechanical arms, armor sets and equipment loadouts. If you enjoy the very specific rush of tinkering together a new build outside a boss arena because you've got the fucker this time, you need to play this game. The boss fights themselves being these knife edge death battles that become razor wire taut with one genius mechanic. You know that moment in a souls like when you run out of health potions and all hope is lost? Well in Lies of P, you can actually gain a single health charge back by landing enough successful attacks. And you can do this at infinium, leaving you desperately clutching out boss fights as you parry and dodge the attacks of these massive creatures, desperate to land enough successful hits for just one more health potion, as they in turn try to pummel you through death's door. The creativity and art direction elevating those encounters from fun boss fights to these spectacular and terrifying showdowns, as you take on these beautiful and hulking mechanical monstrosities, animated with such a tactile joy that you can practically feel the gears click and whir inside them.
them, and that same feeling is present in practically every one of the game's gorgeously designed enemies. Giving Liza P this entirely unique feel, despite how much it may have felt like any other game it might have initially resembled from that first trailer. The level of care and detail bringing the world of Pinocchio to life in this horrifying and utterly captivating form. And also, just to mention, the vibes of the hub area, immaculate. What a peaceful place to hang out. I like being here. It's great. Hello! Welcome to, to the first ever Eyepatch Wolf uh, food review. I live in a city called Dublin. Dublin is a strange place. A lot of people here are nice, but we're all still pretty bummed about the famine. And so it's not often we get happy about anything, especially pastries. I mean, why would you eat a pastry? What did you do to deserve it? You must have some real fucking notions about yourself, don't you? And yet, even the most dour Irish grimace can be softened with the sublime treats available at Cookie Boy, a small pastry shop on Stephen Street Lower. Cookie Boy is run by Dan, and this man cares more about cookies than you have ever cared about anything in your entire life. Not only did he draw the logo for Cookie Boy himself, according to Dan, he has no formal training. He just started making cookies, they were bad, and then he continued making them until they were good. And I cannot imagine the mountain of discarded cookies it took to reach the culinary delight that is his blueberry cheesecake cookie. The balance between the sweet smothery dough and the tart blueberry cream cheese being so heavenly that I cannot help but break out into a stream of mild expletives every time I try one. Just this little delicious son of a bitch. I, I, see, I'm, I'm doing it again. Seriously, if food is art, then I hope I one day make something as good as Cookie Boy's S'mores Cookie. And just to be clear, this is not a sponsorship. I just wanted to shout out a cool place for folks who either live in Dublin or might be visiting it. Now, for full transparency, they did offer me some free cookies when I messaged them about shooting some b-roll, which I did accept because, well, I'm, I'm not made of stone, folks! An emerging trend in modern television is, uh, remember that thing? That show you liked when you were a kid? Well, you stupid fucking dumb baby, we made more of it. That's right, drink the nostalgic nectar, suckle on the milk of your past. Don't look around you, don't think about anything. Don't think about how the world actually is. Just sup from the teat of memory. Everything is fine. You are not in danger. You are not in danger. Well, they made the old X-Men cartoon again in X-Men 97, and I wish I could be cynical about it, but goddamn, it is so good. Yes, X-Men 97 is playing with nostalgia. The art style is near identical to the old show, albeit with a much higher production value, and many of the old voice actors have returned, but I mean, who could have a problem with that? Southern Rogue, yes please. And Yes, the old theme music is back, but I mean, god damn, it's so good! Beyond the glazing of nostalgia, this is a genuinely fantastic show that I really feel gets what that old X-Men cartoon was. Part Saturday morning cartoon, part trashy soap opera, and part genuinely important piece of media with some real shit to say, X-Men 97 understands each of those aspects. The colorful cast of characters, each with their own unique powers, fighting in action scenes that explode with the kinetic energy and color of a barely legal fireworks display, the show reveling in the melodrama and romance of its different cast in a way that is now way hornier than ever. You got Crop Top Gambit, Savage Rogue, and Tiny Speedo's Magneto. Look, I'm just saying, whatever you're into, there's something here for you. Or in my case, an all-you-can-eat buffet, baby! It's goofy, silly fun, but that's also how the show lowers your guard just enough to break you emotionally over its knee, with harrowing depictions of hate and destruction, bringing into focus that the X-Men has always been a story about a group of people trying to rise in a world that is dragging them down, and it is great. Not like how the old cartoons were, but critically, how you remember them. Which is also exactly how I would describe Batman the Caped Crusader, which I'm cramming very late into this script because I think it is literally that good and I think you should watch it. Directed by Bruce Timm and immaculately capturing the soul of what made that original series great, it has the best version of Harley Quinn I have ever seen and I refuse to elaborate why. And also, Invincible Season 2 was also real good and that doesn't really count but I, I just want to say it because I really did think- What do you mean we're running out of time? I run this channel. Wait, who even are you and why are you here in my apartment? Oh god! As I'm reading this script, I'm noticing just how much of it is rooted in nostalgia and a longing for the past, which I think is like a little pathetic. Well, let's hope this next entry fixes that.
Dragon Half is a 1993 anime OVA. God damn it! You ever been scrolling through some social media feed when suddenly a bizarrely well animated yet mysteriously unknown anime gif floats past your screen, leaving naught with a vague air of nostalgia and wonder in its wake? Well, chances are that was an OVA, and specifically one from the 80s or 90s. OVAs, or original video animations, were anime videotapes produced with the intention of selling them direct to consumers. This meant two things. One, studios couldn't rely on cinema releases or broadcasts broadcast slots to create an audience, incentivizing them to make as high quality a piece of animation as they were capable of, and hoping that word of mouth would spread it through hardcore anime communities. And two, because there was no cinematic or broadcast oversight, they could be absolutely wild, which not only resulted in some of the most uncomfortable sex scenes I have seen outside of 2 hours, 21 minutes, and 41 seconds into Bo is Afraid, but a wilder, more experimental approach to animation. Which brings us to Dragon Half. Compared to a lot of what I could recommend, Man, Dragon Half is pretty tame. Mink, our main character, wants tickets to see her favorite pop idol named Dick Saucer, and at some point she stumbles into a fighting tournament. But it's how well it's all pulled off that makes Dragon Half what it is. Its general style is gorgeous, gleeful, bouncy characters ping pong around the screen with this ethereal late 80s anime look, even though it was developed in 1993. I know that. Don't you fucking comment that. Its character proportions and designs warping violently from shot to shot, and it's never anything less than a joy. It's like every Every cut an animator has sat down and thought, let's go fucking mental with this one, and each time they smash it. I'm releasing this video on a Saturday. If you've had a shitty week, if you're tired from all the daily bullshit that accumulates over the course of a seven day cycle and just need a piece of low commitment, high concentration joy to escape to, that is what Dragon Half is for. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Noticed you coming in. I was working on my painting. That's what we do here in the art dimension. A, a new section where I briefly shout out some artists that I think are rad and also may have forgotten to credit in the fake video games video. Chu underscore art is an Irish artist I first took notice of because of their incredible Luke's Awakening screenshot mockups, recreating scenes from the Star War in these beautifully intricate little pixel dioramas. They are gorgeous. I love them. Chocovania is an artist whose work I mistook for some of Plastaboos, and God, I hope people can see the ad admittedly unintentional compliment in there. Their work is a combination of beautifully stylized characters mixed with some of the wildest color design you will ever see, running the gambit from gorgeously designed fake video games to these intensely ethereal landscapes. And also, just this Sonic. I mean, look at him. What a great little guy. Finally, I want to mention Neymupan. There was a reason I picked Neymupan to be the first ever artist to create an Eyepatch Wolves piece, and that's because she is one of my favorite illustrators of all time. Her character work is this impossible combination of intensely technical, but also loose and expressive. Her at times simple figure drawing clad in these gorgeously detailed outfits, the worlds around them cast in some of the most eye-poppingly beautiful color design I have ever seen. And it all comes together to give her pieces this rare quality where you never get tired of looking at them no matter how many times you've seen ah! Links to all the artists in the description below. Please show them some love, my dear Wolfpack. Now, to get back to painting. I know a certain percentage of you are just going to accuse me of only including Love Lies Bleeding on this list due to the casting of Katie O'Brien, and to that I say... Love Lies Bleeding is a beautifully shot and maniacally unhinged 104 minute movie and a story of two human lesbian car crashes falling in love in the 80s as they fight and fuck their way through increasingly terrible scenarios. The film is goddamn gorgeous with cinematography and a soundtrack that combine into this incredible neon tinged atmosphere that surrounds a pounding plot with multiple moments that had the bespeckled gentleman beside me in the cinema raise his hand to his mouth before audibly exclaiming, oh no all crescendoing into a climax so deliriously ludicrous that I wonder if the final lines of this script were perhaps scrawled by a writer that was experiencing some kind of euphoric stroke, and I mean that as a compliment, serving as the perfect capstone to one of the most captivating and insane movies I've seen all year, and yes, look, the fact that Katie O'Brien could probably fold me into a tiny backpack and wear me for a day does not hurt. There, I said it, I said it, you goddamn demon! It is a beautifully strange and soap opera-esque time in pro wrestling. The Judgment Day have become a 
gloriously entertaining teen drama about a bunch of mall goths who started working out, and The Wyatt Six, while still in early days, is the exact kind of spooky wrestle bollocks I love, albeit one with a genuine center of heart and pain that I really hope develops into something that I one day can make a video about. This is all to say that frequently I am finding my favorite matches lean more towards the trashy soap opera side of pro wrestling as opposed to the hardcore technical wordless narratives of your Ring of Honors and New Japans. And then there is Brian Danielson versus Will Osprey at AEW Dynasty. There is little story in the build up to this match and that's because they didn't need it. Danielson's technical hard hitting style melding with Osprey's high impact offense, the two colliding with all the impact of an erupting volcano being struck by a meteorite as both men push each other to their absolute limits till finally Osprey walks the king's road ending the match with the brutal Tiger Driver 91 a move with a mildly horrifying history its use in this match a wordless testament to how far both men have pushed themselves over the course of their entire lives to reach this point the resulting story being something you can show pretty much anyone point to the screen and be like this this is what pro wrestling can be There is a TV show that released this year, one about what it means to hold power, what it means to be remembered, what it is to dedicate your life to a lie and have it destroy everything around you. I I I'm sorry, why is there footage of House of the Dragon on screen? Ren Fair is a three-part documentary and here is the basic plot summary. It is all real, I am embellishing nothing. King George is the owner of the largest renaissance fair in the world that he's been running for 50 years. A five decade odyssey that has cost him his friends, family and all human connection. And now at 85, he has decided that he will die in exactly 10 years and wishes to spend the rest of his days in retirement searching for his future wife who, and I cannot stress this enough, must have healthy, natural breasts. Those are natural breasts? I do not have natural breasts. Okay. We're done. A retirement that will leave a power vacuum at the peak of the Renfair Mountain, leading to a war for the empty throne, with participants such as Jeff, King George's conniving right hand, who has sworn both his entire life as well as that of his infinitely patient wife, God bless that woman, to the service of King George, hoping that said loyalty will earn him the crown, or at least it might do if it were not for another, known as the Lord of Corn, who seems seeks to purchase the fair not with loyalty, but coin. And for however ludicrous this may all sound, it will not compare to the journey this documentary will take you on, as you watch these people contending for the Ren Fair crown twist apart under the maniacal whims of their king, as he dangles them and so many others over the abyss of what if this thing they have dedicated their entire lives to has been for nothing. Not only painting a fascinating portrait of King George, who is simultaneously a genius and a fucking monster, but also a surprisingly moving meditation on what it is to put your all into something and what happens when that something destroys you. I have been playing Tekken the vast majority of my life, and while there are fighting game series I do prefer, Tekken's the one that's always been there. It was there when I booted up my PS2 for the first time and Tekken Tag's intro movie basically rewrote my DNA. It was there in my early 20s when I beat Jinpachi in an arcade in front of a crowd full of people who applauded me, which to this day I hold as one of my most simple yet joyful memories. It was there earlier this year when I went 2 for 2 in my very first fighting game tournament. It's more than just loving Tekken, Tekken has just literally been a part of my life, which is why it is such a delight to say that Tekken 8 is Tekken better than it's ever been. Looking and feeling fucking incredible, Tekken 8 is a joyous celebration of everything this series has been, and you can feel that in everything, from its gleefully insane character endings, to its roster jammed with revitalized takes on so many Tekken classics, now with ludicrously brutal Dragon Ball Z-esque super moves, 
as well as the best newcomer the series has had since Dark Resurrection. Not you, Reina, who is just Heihachi as a mean girl in street fashion, fucking brilliant. Her captivatingly brutal style of gameplay immediately making me abandon all my other Tekken mains. And yeah, I cannot believe I'm saying this, the crowning achievement of Tekken 8 being its story mode. The central premise of which is that if you lose in the Tekken tournament, Kazuya will fly to your home and nuke your country, culminating in a genuinely Yakuza surpassing cinematic showdown that for me contains an emotional good punch so hard it blasted me back through the multiple decades I've spent with this series in a way I may need to talk about in a full video at some point. And so nearly landed at the number one place on this list, except... A spaceship crash lands on an alien planet and the survivors must, well, survive. That's it. And yeah, I seriously doubt you've ever experienced anything like this. Scavenger's Rain is gorgeous. It's barren alien landscapes drawing inspiration from classic sci-fi illustration with scenery that nearly feels pulled from the barren worlds of Mobius, Roger Dean and Peter Elson. Feeling peaceful, serene, but also deeply haunting. A feeling that belies how complicated and dangerous this world is. Every corner of this planet surges with strange life. Alien creatures that feel like aliens should. Divorced and different from anything in our ecosystem. Instead, forming their own complex system of behaviors and hierarchies with animation that makes each of those creatures move in these distinctive and mesmerizing ways. This is the planet of Scavenger's Reign and the simple joy of this show is watching the survivors learn to navigate and understand it, utilizing its wildlife and natural resource in all these fantastic and brilliant ways. But there can also be a real horror in those interactions and in particular in the multitude of disturbing things this planet does to people, leading to some of the most profoundly nightmarish body horror mashed with existential terror that I've seen in a long time. And it's fucking brilliant, easily one of the best TV shows to come out this decade, and more importantly, something else. You may have noticed an ongoing theme of nostalgia in this video, and that's because by the time this video goes out, I will have left the home I've been living for 10 years and be somewhere new, which is good. Only, I ain't so great at change. Uh, I worry about the future a lot and the unknown it brings, and media that feels nostalgic or familiar tends to be a comfort in that. But with Scavenger's Reign, Scavenger's Reign doesn't feel familiar. It doesn't feel like anything I've ever watched. It feels weird and different, and it makes me excited about what else might be possible. Both in the shows like it, it might inspire, or other stories that just feel as new and different as this does. It makes me hopeful about the future. Because the future doesn't always have to be scary. Inevitably, good things gotta be there too, right? That's what this show makes me feel. Okay, unfortunately, that is where this video should end, but there's one more thing we gotta talk about. Ugh. So Akira Toriyama died. And... It's hard to even know where to start with that. But... I don't know that there's a single other artist in living memory that transformed the industry around them like Toriyama did. Yeah, Battle Shonen existed before him, but... The way he codified it created an era of shonen that we are still living in. But it's also so much more than that. Uh, there's this old godforsaken shopping center near where I grew up called uh, Nut Grove Shopping Center. And it is a place where uh, franchises go to die. And I spent so long in that shopping center as a child hoping to find any anime merch or just anyone else in Ireland who even knew what anime was. And I was walking through there recently and in one of the claw machines there was this little Vegeta plush. Um, and it was like, man, if Toriyama's work can pierce the dark corners of Nutgrove fucking shopping center, it speaks to how globally influential he was. But I think sometimes when you talk about how global Toriyama's work was and how influential he was, 
what can get lost in that is what a fucking spectacular artist he was too. Look at the way this dude drew characters. Look at their poses, look at their designs, look at how closely he was watching contemporary fashion and expressing his character's personalities through their outfits. Look at how he drew machines, not as these cold, precise, angular contraptions, but as these soft, warm designs that felt built by people. He was an artist who just put detail and love into everything he did, and it didn't matter if it was a large, bald man snapping the neck of a tiny child, or just the joy in the way his pages flowed and unfolded before you, with all these little touches, like this page where Goku's fist breaks the top of the panel, creating such an incredible sense of depth and fun. That's what Toriyama's work was, you know, it was fun. It's, it's a blast to experience no matter how many times you read it. And if you somehow have not read Dragon Ball Volume 1, the strongest recommendation I will give you this video is to go fucking do that. He was an incredible artist, and even months after his death, it's hard to parse the fact that he's gone, and impossible not to reflect on how this dude changed my life. You know, I got into exercise because of Dragon Ball. I got into martial arts because of Dragon Ball. Vegeta training in the gravity chamber became roughly two thirds of my personality. And I'm never gonna stop being grateful for that. But it's also so much more than that, you know? It was the work Toriyama's work inspired that is the entire reason this channel exists. So you can all blame him. This dude literally massively changed my life and I am so, so grateful for that. But the thing is, I know that is just one tiny part of Toriyama's legacy. And I know that there are so many people, so many of you watching this who have your own stories about how Toriyama's work affected you. And so what I would really love to see in the comments of this video are people sharing that. Your favorite Toriyama characters, character designs, illustrations, series, video game work, just everything. Let's celebrate this dude one final time on this channel. And I think with that, there's really only one way to end this video. And that is to say, thank you so much to Akira Toriyama.